Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. One about a missing 17 year old girl that took 19 years to solve and it happened right here where I live in Western Australia and was one of our state's most baffling cold cases for many years. Hayley Dodd had seemingly disappeared into thin air back in 1999. And before anyone says anything, you're not having deja vu, I did cover this case on my old channel about two years ago, but go to my community tab or the comments below for a further explanation as to why I'm redoing this case. It is not the same video though, not even close. It has been completely rescripted. This video is a far more detailed and there has been case updates since 2018. But if you've never seen my old channel, just disregard everything I just said. And before we get into it, I want to thank today's sponsor. A sponsor that means a lot to me because they were actually the first sponsor to sponsor this channel. And that is June's Journey. So June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game set in the roaring 1920s that follows the very glamorous June Parker through solving the case of of who killed her sister. So if you're a true crime fan, and I'm gonna assume that you are since you have landed yourself on this video, you're going to really enjoy a game like this that not only follows a true crime storyline through each scene, which by the way, the graphics on this game are truly beautiful, but the game also allows you to take some time to yourself and escape the world, which is something I think we really all need right now. I find especially when I'm waking up in the morning, I like to play for a little bit on my phone because the game does provide me with a little bit of mental stimulation. I need to wake up and function for my day as a flight attendant, that's my day job, <laughs> which is a job that requires me to be really observant, by the way. So this game is perfect. I actually used to wake up and just scroll through social media, which really, never made me feel really good in the morning. And by the way, June's Journey is free, yay, <laughs> to download, and is on both Android and iOS, so you don't have anything to lose by checking it out. Again, without sponsors, it would not be possible to keep this channel running, so please consider checking out June's Journey in the link below. It's a free way in which you can help your girl out, and yes, I totally ripped off Christina Randall's outro, if you know, you know. <laughs> Having said all of that, Let's get into today's, let's get, what? <laughs> let's get into today's solved case. Hayley Marie Dodd was born in Western Australia on November the 30th, 1981 to parents Margaret and Raymond Dodd. She had four siblings, Rayanne, Tony, Byron, and Martin. Hayley, who was described as a very happy person, lived in the city of Mandra, which is a little city south of Perth. In 1999, Hayley was 17 years old, turning 18, and I assume, although I couldn't find any information to confirm it, that it was her first year out of high school. We finished school at 17 years old here in WA, Western Australia. Therefore, 1999 would have been Hayley's first year of freedom. So it's no surprise, she was on the hunt for an adventure. By July of 1999, Hayley and her good friend, Lisa Fredrickson, decided it was time to plan a, fl a fun little adventure for themselves. They made plans to head off on a hitchhiking adventure across Western Australia, starting in the small country town of Dongara. This was not the pair's first hitchhiking rodeo, though. The two friends had successfully hitchhiked, hitchhiked I'm tongue-tied today, from Mandra to the small town of Pinjara in the past, which is about a 20-minute trip. I should also add in here, the girls' hitchhiking adventure was actually being kept a secret from Haley's parents. She told her parents that herself and Lisa were catching a bus to Dongra because she was worried they'll try to talk her out of it, which they probably would have given the recent Claremont serial killer case here in Perth at the time and the fairly recent Ivan Malat backpacker killings where Malat picked up hitchhikers and killed them and the less recent but the local Bernie's case, a couple that picked up young girls and killed them across Perth. 
I do have a video on all of those cases by the way, I'll link them down below if you have not heard of them and you're interested to hear about them. Despite this, Lisa said that Hayley was happy, excited and looking forward to it. In late July, the two friends set off to Dongra, which is just over 4 hours by car, roughly 430 kilometers or 267-ish miles, so quite the way to hitchhike. The reason they were heading to Dongra, however, was for work. They had both secured some casual work as a rouseabout with a local sheep shearing team. A rouseabout being a person that does odd jobs or unskilled labour on a farm, basically. So the pair made it to Dongra without issue and headed to a local caravan park where they were planning to stay for their time in the small country town. The friends had a few days before they started their new casual jobs, so they spent some time just relaxing and doing a little bit of shopping. And while shopping, Hayley bought herself a brand new pair of earrings. They were silver cross earrings with a turquoise stone in the middle. Little did Hayley or Lisa know just how important these pair of earrings would soon become. Just before the girls were due to start work, Hayley had a last minute change of mind. She told Lisa she wanted to go visit some friends that lived on a farm in the town of Mora. Now Mora is south, so back towards Perth. It's kind of the halfway mark between Perth and Dongra. So not exactly a quick trip, about two hours by car and to hitchhike or maybe even longer. Hayley had decided she wanted to make this quick trip on her own and told Lisa she would be back soon. I'm not exactly sure how long Hayley had planned to be gone for. From my research, it was either just for the day or for a day or two. The day she left, Hayley had been wearing jeans, a black v-neck top and a men's grey hooded jacket. She also had on light brown hiking boots, a matching light brown bag with the word equip on the front and her silver cross earrings with the turquoise stones. Lisa, who was concerned for her friend's safety as she would be hitchhiking alone, handed Hayley her pocket knife before she left and $5 in change to call her when she got to her destination before giving Hayley one last hug goodbye, believing she would see her friend in a matter of days. According to Lisa, when Hayley left, she was happy and in good spirits. Now, I do want to quickly address the hitchhiking situation before anyone comments and I think rude about the girls' decisions. For one, this was 21 years ago, 1999. The girls were only 17 years old as well. Although there had been a few cases of hitchhikers going missing and turning up dead, like the ones I mentioned before, you have to understand that here in Perth and Western Australia back then, I believe at least, people felt relatively safe. I'm not defending their decision, but I want to give context having grown up myself in the 90s. Perth kind of has a small country town feel sometimes, and in 1999, it was even more so like that. I think as well hitchhiking together, the girls probably felt safe. And once they were out of Perth and in the quiet country towns, with the trustworthy country town people, that Hayley felt confident to hitchhike alone. Okay, sorry for the speech, but let me know your thoughts down below. So on July the 29th, 1999, a Thursday at around 8am, Hayley set off to find a lift down to Mora. She stopped in at the petrol station in Dongara where she knocked on the window of a truck driver. Lisa had advised her friend to try to get lifts with truck drivers and older people, as she deemed these people more trustworthy. The truck driver whose window Hayley knocked on was Donald Wayne Spry, who that day was making the trip from the small town of Walkaway to Perth. Hayley, who he described as a very tiny little girl, asked if it would be possible to hitch a ride down to Mora on his way back to Perth, and Donald agreed to take her most of the way there. He took Hayley all the way to Badjingara, which is about an hour and a half car journey, and Badjingara was literally a hop, a skip, and a jump away from Hayley's final destination of Mora. It was about another 30 minutes by car. Looking at a map, it appeared going to Badjingara instead of directly to Perth would have only been a slight detour for Donald. And I'm sorry for only a few minutes into this video and you've already seen like 10 maps pop up on the screen. Hopefully the context helps. Let me know. <laughs> the truck driver, Donald Wayne Spry, said that Hayley was happy and bubbly on their 90 odd minute long trip to Badjingara, describing her as being like a very young little girl, like a child. 
The pair made small talk with Haley telling Donald she was visiting Donga from Mandra, where she had some casual work as a rouseabout lined up, but was on her way to visit some friends in Mora for the day before heading back to Donga. Donald said that Haley was polite, even laughing at his jokes, which I guess couldn't have been too funny because Donald said she laughed at them to be nice, I suppose. They also talked a lot about horses as Donald had experience in rodeo and cattle stations. And according to Donald, the subject of horses seemed to really pique Haley's interest. He also mentioned that he thought Haley looked to be much younger than her actual age of 17. He said she looked to be around 14 years old. So the pair eventually made it to Bajangara where Donald dropped Haley off at a petrol station. He gave Haley his number for when she decided to head back to Dongra. My guess is that as a truck driver, he was doing a lot of driving around WA, back and forth between towns, and probably was going past Dongra often on his travels. So he put the offer out there just in case he was able to help her out again. Donald got the impression from their conversation that Haley wanted to get back to Dongra as soon as possible, probably due to the fact that she was about to start work. He also gave Haley $15 for lunch after she told him she didn't have any money in her bank account. Haley thanked Donald for everything and waved goodbye, but despite his offer, Donald would never hear from Haley again. After arriving in Bajangara, Haley started walking along Northwest Road. She soon stopped at a phone box on the same road near the Bajangara Roadhouse to make a phone call, although I'm not sure to whom. Not long after this, Haley managed to hitch another lift to take her further down Northwest Road and a little closer to her friend's farm in Mora. At 11am, Haley was dropped off at the corner of Northwest Road and Winjardi Road, which is about 11 kilometers east of Bajangara. A witness, Fiona Weaver, was on her way to Bajangara Primary School when she saw Haley get out of a gold-colored Commodore on Northwest Road. The road, as you will see on the screen, is pretty deserted, and Haley looked so young, so I assume that's what made her stand out to witnesses. Fiona Weaver, who was being dropped off by her husband, became concerned about a young girl standing alone and asked her husband to drive the same route back home to see if the girl was still there. I'm a bit confused as to whether Fiona was dropped off at the primary school and her husband drove back the same way or whether they looped around to see where the girl was. But either way, when Fiona and or her husband drove back the same way, they spotted Haley near the entrance of the rubbish tip and can confirm that Haley was not attempting to hitch a ride at that time nor did she even acknowledge the couple's car as it drove past. Between 11am and 11.45am, 10 witnesses saw Haley walking along Northwest Road. Some also seeing her at the rubbish tip entrance, with the last person seeing her crouching down and searching through her backpack. By 12pm, Haley had disappeared off Northwest Road and was never seen again. Around this time, a man that had pulled over on the side of the road nearby where Haley was last seen due to his engine overheating, heard a dog bark and a female scream somewhere nearby. On July 30th, the next day, when Haley's friend Lisa never heard from her, Haley was reported missing by her family. During the investigation, there were dozens of persons of interest that police said were neither implicated nor eliminated. Some of these people that were persons of interest were Robin McCartney, who would go on to kill a woman in Geraldton, which is a small town near WA, just four months after Haley's disappearance. Mark Pendleton was also named as a person of interest, and he was a school teacher who would be later named one of WA's worst pedophiles. And another person of interest was Bajingara local and part-time gardener for the local primary school, Francis John Walk. When investigators interviewed Francis Walk, he stated at the time Haley went missing, he had been in the middle of his weekly ritual, which was about a half an hour drive away from Bajangara. This ritual was his weekly trip to Mora, the place Haley had been heading, where he returned and hired videos, paid bills, did his grocery shopping, and visited the local butcher. He told investigators he could not have taken Haley 
because he was nowhere near where she was last seen. Walk said he returned to his Bajangara home at around 1pm that day and not long after this he set out to Perth on his motorbike to attend a party, leaving him no time, according to him, to abduct or kill a girl. And I should mention, he left Bajagara for Perth so bloody fast, he forgot to unpack his groceries that he had just bought from Mora. And he didn't even pack one single thing to take with him down to Perth for the night. Then Walk got in a crash on his motorbike on his way down to Perth and ended up in Royal Perth Hospital, where he says was the first time he heard about Haley Dodd's disappearance. I'll say for an innocent man, he certainly was in one hell of a rush and seemed pretty all over the place, so much so that he landed himself in a pretty serious accident. After this, it was Walk himself that contacted police in regards to Haley's disappearance because he was a local to the area, according to him. And this is when police decided to come and speak with him in person. When police came to chat with him, Francis Walk told investigators he had not seen any hitchhikers in Bajangara that day, but if he had, he would have given them a lift. Like, why would you tell police that? He stated he would have remembered seeing any hitchhikers because no one really hitchhiked in the remote area Haley was last seen in, and it was especially rare to see young girls hitchhiking around there. And side note, I literally do not understand. If he was nowhere in the area where Haley disappeared, as he himself claims, why insert yourself into the investigation when you didn't even witness anything? Like who rings the police and tells them what they didn't witness? I'll leave you to ponder that thought for yourself though. Three days after Haley was dropped off in Bajangara, the truck driver that dropped her off, Donald Wayne Spry, was at home watching the news when they started talking about a missing girl from Western Australia. When they put the young girl's photo on the TV screen, Donald instantly recognised her. It was the same girl he had given a lift to just days earlier, Haley. He realised he had never heard back from her and immediately phoned the police, telling them everything that he knew. As time went on, investigators were getting no closer to solving what had happened to Haley Dodd. As I said, the persons of interest they had could neither be ruled in or out. Years passed and eventually it was 2013 and police were preparing for a coronial inquest into Haley's disappearance and suspected death. During the preparation, investigators read over Francis Walk's statements pertaining to his alibi on the day Haley went missing, who by the way had moved from Badgingara to Queensland shortly after Haley's disappearance. And upon reading these statements, police noticed some inconsistencies. These inconsistencies led to a complete re-examination of all the evidence that had been confiscated from Walk's property back in 1999, including an examination of the vehicle he was driving the day Haley went missing. On September the 5th, 2013, forensic scientist Tracy Horner closely examined Walk's ute that had been kept in evidence for 14 years. I don't think they had the actual ute itself in evidence, but parts of the ute, like the seat covers for example. I couldn't get confirmation on this though. But either way, when Tracy Horner was closely studying the fabric of the car seat cover, which had been kept in a sealed paper bag, a tiny, small, shiny object caught her eye. It was a single earring that had been embedded into the car seat cover's fabric. The design of the earring was a silver cross with a turquoise stone in the middle. Somehow, although the vehicle had been inspected several times previous by experienced police officers, no one had seen the tiny silver cross in the seat cover fabric. Luckily, 14 years previous, Haley's travel companion, Lisa, had sketched an accurate picture of what the earring looked like that Haley had been wearing on the day she disappeared. The same earrings she had bought 
on those first few days in Dongra and handed the sketch over to the police. However, the earring evidence would not be enough to convict Francis Walk because according to the shop owner, this particular piece of jewellery had been very popular and mass produced. This meant that they would have to dig a little bit deeper into Walk's vehicle for evidence that Haley had been there. And it wasn't long before they found what they needed. Buried amongst the dust and dirt that a vacuum cleaner had picked up off the floor of the ute was a single 18 millimeter strand of human hair. The hair was sent away for testing and after several months and being tested in laboratories across several different states and countries, forensic scientists concluded that it was 7.2 million times more likely than not that Haley contributed to the DNA found on the hair. Although the DNA levels on the strand of the hair were actually pretty low and traces of an unknown male DNA were also found on the strand. I am no forensic scientist, clearly, but from what I was reading, references linked down below as always, when DNA is mixed together, it makes it harder to get an accurate result. They couldn't definitely say yes, this is Haley's strand of hair, but it was more likely than not that it was. The hair was also black and coarse, where Haley's was fine and brown. So take that for what you will. They did also examine the earring, but unfortunately no DNA could be retrieved from it. So now we have two pieces of physical evidence that point to the possibility that Frances Walk was responsible for Haley's disappearance, which meant of course, police had to re-interview him. However, Walk was no longer in Western Australia in 2013. In fact, police found him sitting in a jail cell all the way over in Queensland serving a 12-year sentence for tying up and physically and sexually assaulting a woman, and this woman was known as Miss M. And it would be Miss M that would lead investigators to the next piece of evidence. In 2007, Miss M, who was then 31 years old, was walking along a highway in Queensland in the early hours of the morning when Frances Walk offered to give her a lift home. The woman accepted the lift, but instead of being driven home, Walk took Mrs. M back to his house. When she tried leaving, Walk hit her over the head with a piece of wood and dragged her inside his home by her hair. Mrs. M was tied up and sexually assaulted for several hours and would later go on to say that she believed she was going to be killed. During the ordeal, Frances Walk requested something from Mrs. M that she would never forget and she would later go on to tell police and that was that he requested one of her earrings. He told her, I want to keep it. This piece of evidence leaned into the idea that Walk had taken Haley's earring after abducting her but had likely lost it or dropped it in the vehicle not realising it was caught in the seat cover. Luckily, Mrs M did manage to escape and went straight to the police. So in November of 2013, police travelled to Townsville in Queensland to re-interview Frances Walk where he stuck by his original alibi of having been in Mora, completing his weekly ritual when Haley went missing, and he maintained his innocence. He told police at the end of the three and a half hour interview, I'm not guilty, you're wasting your time. Two-ish years after this interview, in December of 2015, Francis John Walk was extradited from Queensland to Perth and charged with the murder of Haley Dodd, despite the fact her body had still not been found. So the trial, which was a judge alone trial, began in late 2017, where Walk pled not guilty. Throughout the trial, the defence argued that the cross earrings found in Walk's ute could have been another woman's earrings, due to the popularity of the earring design and that it was possible that this strand of hair did not belong to Haley. And in fact, the judge somewhat agreed with this, saying she was not persuaded that the hair had been Haley's. The defence also suggested that the earring had been planted by police, who had been desperate to solve Haley's case. The last major point that the defence brought up was the timeline of events, and the fact that Walk would have had an incredibly tight 
time frame in between doing his shopping in Mora and leaving for Perth. There was also the fact that with how much time had passed since her disappearance, the memories from witnesses were not as strong and some witnesses had passed away. The trial would last for seven weeks and in the end, at 61 years old, Francis John Walk was found guilty of abducting and killing Haley. The earring and propensity evidence being that he had picked up a young female hitchhiker before and assaulted her were enough to put him behind bars for a minimum of 21 years. Although the judge did state she did not believe that Walk had planned to kill Haley, but to sexually assault her, as with the Mrs. M case, and in the process, had ended up killing Haley. Although Mrs. M did escape, so who knows what his intentions were. To this day, Walk maintains his innocence, and the body of Haley Dodd has never been found. And also here in Western Australia, we have the no body, no parole laws, which means convicted killers cannot be released until they confess where the body is, which of course, Walk has not. But it does not end there, I'm afraid. Francis Walk appealed his conviction earlier this year, 2020, and won meaning his conviction was overturned and he will face a new trial. The Court of Appeals Justice Michael Beach commented as to why it was overturned, stating, acceptance of Walk's account of when he left Mora would have required an acquittal, which just goes to show that one simple mistake can lead to a retrial. A few other pieces of evidence will also be examined in the retrial, and these include the collection and storage of evidence used in the conviction, the fact that the earring was not found in the car seat cover until 2013, despite being examined by experienced police officers, the timeline Walk gave investigators as to where he was when Haley disappeared, and the propensity evidence. I will keep you guys updated over on Twitter though and my community tab as the new trial unfolds, which by the way is set for February of next year and it will run for nine and a half weeks, so still a while away yet. But I do wanna hear your thoughts on this case, the trial, the evidence, and the retrial. I think this was an interesting one, that is for sure. Having said all of that, thank you so much for being here and thank you for listening to Haley's story. And also thank you to my amazing Channel members, you are all absolute stars. Follow me on my socials to stay up to date in between videos. Like, comment, share, subscribe if you like what I'm doing here. <laughs> Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye, guys.